situation of the human rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and intersex persons in Canada. Uh, this hearing has been requested by EGAL Canada, and we warmly welcome you and look forward to your presentation. And we equally welcome the ambassador and the representatives of the state of Canada this afternoon. I'm joined this afternoon by the first vice president of the commission and the rapporteur for Canada, Commissioner Rosemary Antoine. I'm also joined by Commissioner, uh, Commissioner James Caballaro. And um, I have responsibility for the rights of LGBTI persons under the auspices of the new rapporteurship. Uh, I want to invite the petitioners um, to make their presentation. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a great honor to be here today and to speak with you. And to th I'd like to thank you for uh, convening this hearing today. Um, I realize that I have a very short period of time to speak, so I'm going to try and move as quickly as I can through the presentation. And if there are details that I'm not able to get through, I hope to be able to send the information to, the, uh, to you. Um, so the focus of the presentation is on the lived experience of LGBTQ2S, and the 2S stands for Two-Spirit Persons in Canada Since Marriage Equality. Um, I think there's a perception in much of the world that rights for LGBTI persons has more or less been achieved, um, and we are certainly aware that in compared to certain countries, uh, LGBTI persons do have it reasonably, uh, things are, are reasonably good, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, and that's what we wish to highlight in today's presentation. So briefly, I would like to touch upon the situation on hate crimes in Canada, um, some of the challenges that LGBTQS students face in Canadian schools. I will talk about homelessness, trans inclusion, seniors, and some of the unique challenges that are facing Canada's Aboriginal community, uh, those who are sexual, uh, sexual minorities or have um, as such. Um, a little bit about us first. Uh, so EGAL Canada is Canada's only national LGBT human rights organization. We have a long history uh, intervening before the Supreme Court of Canada. We're involved with the Supreme Court uh, case, which was in, uh, connected to same-sex marriage. We operate domestically and international, and within Canada are perhaps known best for our Safer Schools program, where we work with a variety of provincial, provincial governments to facilitate more inclusive education and programming. Uh, we do have a growing international portfolio as well. Um, we have significant relationships with the UN and the Council of Europe, and we're very happy to be here at the OAS as well. Uh, and we work closely with the government of Montenegro to improve human rights for LGBT persons in the Western Balkans. Uh, and we will be in the Baltic states uh, in the coming weeks as well, so we're, we're very excited about that. Um, what I wanted to start with today was to talk about hate crimes in Canada, as this is a very serious issue. Um, the way I like to think about it is that hate crimes directed against the LGBTQS community in Canada are a serious and yet often unknown and poorly understood problem. Um, the most recent reporting data that we have, which was released in 2011, or 2012, excuse me, indicated that hate crimes motivated by sexual orientation or a victim's actual or perceived sexual orientation increased by 10%. And it represents a total of 18% of all hate crimes in Canada. Uh, and what's particularly troubling is that these hate crimes, so hate crimes on the, uh, which are on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, increased while for other areas, such as crimes motivated by race or ethnicity, they decreased in comparison. So you see diverging trends, increasing for sexual orientation, decreasing for race or ethnicity. So this is, this is cause for concern. The other point that I'd like to draw your attention to is that hate crimes motivated by sexual orientation are the most violent types of hate crimes in Canada. And they often, 65% of reported hate crimes based on sexual orientation involve violence. Moreover, victims of sexual orientation tend to be younger than the average, uh, with 50% under the age of 25. So that's an unacceptable statistic. And if I can just draw your attention to the chart for a moment, you'll see that the victims also are disproportionately young as well, uh, in the seven, 12 to 17, 18 to 24 uh, age groups, as well as tw uh, 25 to 34, and then it starts to drop off. But what's also surprising 
is that the distribution of hate crimes based on those who are accused also is skewed towards younger people. So the largest single group, a plurality, is in the 12 to 17 range. So it suggests to us that a lot of these hate crimes, uh, it's very young people who are actually uh, engaging in them. So briefly, EGAL has worked with police services across Canada to try and address this challenge. We've launched Report Homophobic Violence, which is a police reporting scheme which encourages victims of hate-motivated crime to speak to police services. Um, versions of RHVP are currently in operation in 20 Canadian cities, but limited funding prevents the expansion of this program and similar programs to other jurisdictions, particularly in more remote parts of the country. So it's a good program, but it's not operating everywhere. And that's something that we think needs to be addressed. The increasing rates of hate crime, moreover, um, directed against the LGBTQ2S community has received little to no response from the federal government. These groups are a targeted population, but we think that the federal government needs to make a more substantive effort to address this challenge, particularly within its efforts to combat hate crimes. Now, as you may recall, the uh, distribution of people who have been accused of hate crimes in Canada are generally younger. And so in our study, we found that there's a huge amount of discrimination and homophobia, which is in Canadian schools. In the first national survey of its kind, which was released in 2011, 70% of participating students indicated that they had heard homophobic comments every day in their schools. And 74% of students who identify as transgender said, claimed that they had been verbally harassed. And more than one in five LGBTQ students reported being physically harassed or assaulted due to their perceived sexual orientation or gender identity. So that's almost a quarter have been physically harassed or assaulted in Canadian schools because of their perceived sexual orientation or gender identity. Moreover, 64% argued that they had they felt unsafe in school, that say, school was not a safe environment. Um, and there's many other findings from this survey. But these very concerning statistics have led to our Safer Schools campaign, um, and that so safe schools must be part of any strategy to improve the lived experience for LGBTQS persons within the country. Uh, we do work very closely with several provincial governments. Um, however, in several jurisdictions, Public opinion hostile to LGBT persons has led to political resistance, either in the form of elected officials, education ministries, or education trustees. And this prevent, often restricts our access to provide resources for school boards, for teachers, for educators, to imp create more inclusive curriculum and safer school environments. While education falls is a provincial jurisdiction within Canada, we strongly believe that the state has a role to play in fostering safer schools and encouraging uh, safe environments for all, including where provincial governments were, are perhaps less willing to engage in that. Another area I'd like to draw your attention to is homelessness. Um, we know from our own research that LGBTQ2S youth are greatly overrepresented in Canada's homeless population. In a survey that recently came out in Toronto, 21% of the city's homeless identified as LGBTQ. And we expect that similar levels of homelessness for uh, LGBT persons exist in other Canadian cities. These youth in our research consistently report feeling trepidation in accessing services for fear of vi uh, systemic victimization. Now we know that there's many causes associated with homelessness, um, but we believe that there are certain uh, causes that are unique to LGBTQS students, or youth, excuse me. Many are kicked out because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Some youth will come to urban centers on their own accord because they're attracted to what's perceived as a more tolerant uh, community. Trans youth may come to Canadian cities, larger cities for medical reasons. Um, as well, a lack of inclusion within our schools leads some youth to drop out. Uh, and at lacking meaningful educational credentials, they'll struggle to find good employment. We also know, regrettably, that a large swath of the shelter system in Canada is very homophobic. So what we are encouraging the state to do is we need a national housing strategy 
that explicitly recognizes and accommodates the needs of LGBTQ2S youth. It needs to be there because they face many unique challenges. And connected with this is uh, suicide. So we know that homelessness and rejection from your family take a very large toll on mental health uh, and, an over, and a person's overwhelmed being. Suicide also is the second leading cause of death among Canadians aged 15 to 24. Um, every year, 500 Canadian youth will take their own lives. And although there is not a lot, there's not a huge amount of, of uh, very recent research which focuses on the connection between suicide and sexual orientation, we do know that suicidal ideation and behavior are disproportionately prevalent within the LGBTQ community compared to their heterosexual peers. Uh, a quite a groundbreaking survey that came out in 2010 highlighted that Ontario youth who identified as transgender Almost 43% of them had made a suicide attempt in the, previous, in, in the past. Other findings more or less demonstrate the same results. So in a study from 2008, it was found that the relationship between bullying and suicide is stronger for the LGBT community. We also know that in a study that was in Manitoba and Northwestern Ontario, 28% of transgender and two-spirit people had attempted suicide at least once. And in a survey based in Ontario, 47% of trans youth had thought about suicide, and 19% of those who participated in the survey had attempted suicide in the previous year. So there's a disproportionate presence of LGBTQ2S persons who fall into this group of people who are at risk of suicide. So we believe, as a result of this, that it's imperative that the Canadian government develop a strategy that to combat youth suicide that explicitly recognizes the challenges faced by the LGBTQS 2S community. Um, we're, in our own work, we're working with the Ontario coroners to develop a protocol that will be used to identify whether sexual orientation or gender identity may have been a contributing factor leading to the tragic death of a young person. And we strongly encourage the federal government to support this um, and that LGBTQ2S circumstances need to be included within a national suicide prevention strategy aimed at young people. We think that's crucially important. I also would like to touch upon uh, trans inclusion within Canada. Um, while legal rights for uh, the, the lesbian and gay community has certainly advanced within Canada, <clears throat> protections for trans people remain limited and vary by jurisdiction. So unlike other minority groups, transgender, transsexual, and gender variant Canadians do not have protections under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms because they're not recognized as, as an identifiable group. And gender identity is not recognized within the Communi Canadian Human Rights Act. There is a bill which is in the uh, Canadian Senate at the moment, uh, Bill C-279, which would, uh, which seeks to amend the, gen the, uh, the Canadian Human Rights Act to include gender identity, but that bill has been stalled for quite some time, and it's unclear whether it will be passed due to a significant amount of opposition. Um, and so we, we are urging the Canadian government to pass this legislation as we think it's very important and that trans people deserve the same kinds of human rights protections as all other Canadians. We also would like to point out that um, Canadians who identify as trans living outside of major urban centres generally lack access to medical care. And oftentimes trans people are required to undergo sexual reassignment surgery before changing their official documents. Um, we think this violates the inherent right of trans people to determine their own identity. We also, it's in crucial to, you know, it's taking a step back from the legal situation for a moment, it's important to realize that the legal and legislative barriers faced by trans persons often result in them having limited access to meaningful employment, and many unfortunately turn to sex work as a, as a means for subsistence. Um, and so it's crucial that people are made aware of that. Um, this is perhaps less well known, but I want to touch on the situation for seniors who identify as LGBTQ2S. So many seniors came into adulthood and maturity having in internalized the belief that they were inherently sick abnormal or sinful, 
and that the, some of the more progressive legislation that we have now was not there when they were growing up. For example, as so someone who was, bo who was born in 1933 would be 36 when sodomy was particularly decriminal par partially decriminalized in 1969. 40 when the American Psychiatric Association delisted homosexuality, and 62 when the Supreme Court of Canada officially banned discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, and 72 when same-sex marriage became federal law in 2005. And this history has significant effects. Um, it has profound effects, one could say, on baseline mental health, family connectedness, kinship networks, economic security, and a sense of self-worth. And we, our research has indicated that many LGBTQ seniors fear accessing community care, long-term health facilities, and they're in fact five times less likely to use senior services than the rest of the population. And so this is, this is a really understudied issue, and uh, we, we really wish to draw attention to it because there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, many of these seniors lack the kinship networks and support networks that their heterosexual peers have in older age. Um, Canada's Aboriginal community, so this is briefly talking more about two-spirit Canadians, they face many, many unique challenges. Um, and in a report that was produced by the National Aboriginal Health Organization found that LGBT and two-spirit Aboriginal youth are two times more likely to face assault than their heterosexual peers. And homophobia within uh, Canada's Aboriginal community often drives youth off reservations, off, off you know, their places of where they grew up, into the city where they may not have support networks in place. Now, we realize that homophobia has many different manifestations, and you know, there are many unique circumstances in Canada's many Aboriginal communities. But we think that more outreach needs to occur um, to combat homophobia. Um, and without sort of the proper resources, in effect, uh, it's very easy for youth to become street involved and part of high risk communities. So there needs to be a strategy, a national strategy in place, working in partnership with Canada's Aboriginal communities to combat homophobia within, within their own communities. Um, and we have done some outreach with Inigal, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, the same-sex couples in Canada also face many unique forms of discrimination when attempting to found families. <clears throat> Current laws privilege heterosexual couples if parents choose to employ assisted reproductive technologies. Um, and same-sex couples face various administrative processes, legal uncertainties, and financial costs associated with adoption that their heterosexual couples do not face. And this, again, is something that's often not known. Um, and it's not until people actually try and found families that they realize that there's a lot of legal obstacles against same-sex couples in Canada that, that, that needs to be addressed. Um, I'd like to finish my presentation, because I know I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I don't have a whole lot of time left, in turn to Canada's role in promoting LGBTQ rights overseas. Um, you know, LGBT rights are, are in the news a lot these days, but Despite the occasional press release or public statement, Canada actually has a very limited role in promoting rights for LGBTQ persons overseas. For example, marginal amounts of Canada's development assistance is targeted at LGBT communities, while a lot of large recipients of Canadian aid actually maintain extraordinarily negative attitudes towards sexual minorities. The designated country of origin list is also a problem. That system, um, that system ba creates a, a safe list of countries where people seeking asylum will have their applications fast-tracked, um, and the ability to appeal is significantly diminished. And we argue that many countries that are on that list, which may appear to be democratic and have robust human rights protections, actually have very repressive policies in practice towards LGBT persons. Um, and so more work needs to be done to ensure that the designated country of origin list um, accurately reflects the lived experience for LGBT persons in their country of origin. And because we don't want people being sent back to countries where they may face persecution because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, and we just don't think there's enough accountability in the federal government in making it transparent 
how countries get on that list, how they don't, and what specific oversight there is to ensure that the LGBTQ reality is taken into consideration when placing countries on the, the designated country of origin list or not. My, in my concluding remarks, I would like to say that you know, while marriage equality has been achieved in Canada, an immense amount of homophobia, societal, political, and institutional still exists in Canada. And we are in urgent need of greater accountability and leadership uh, at the national level to promote human rights for LGBTQ2S persons. Domestically, for example, there is negligible funding for LGBTQ2S causes. And this, this really limits the ability of organizations and communities to fight for their rights, for fight for enhanced protections. There's also no national partnership between the federal government and the national LGBTQS to ask human rights organization, nor a clear human rights strategy that's explicit to the rights of LGBTQ to ask persons. And I would conclude by saying that there's also no federal recognition of our work, both either domestically with provincial governments, with police forces, um, the Youth Suicide Prevention Summit that we recently held in Toronto, or our work internationally, whether it be in the Western Balkans, at the UN, or perhaps even at the OAS. So thank you very much for hearing from me today. I hope you found this information informative. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador, could I invite you and your delegation to respond on behalf of Canada? Thank you very much, uh, President. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning, it's not very often that Canada is here at the Human Rights Commission, but I just want to express um, our appreciation for being here. We do embrace these hearings. We participate actively, and um, we're very pleased to, to be here. Um, every society in the Americas can improve, and it's in that spirit that Canada, the government of Canada is here because we see these hearings as essential for helping us to improve our own Canadian society. So with those brief words of introduction, I'll have pass the floor over to my colleague, Hélène Berube, for the presentation. Good afternoon. My name is Hélène Berube, and I am counsel for the Government of Canada. With me today are Ambassador Alan Cullum, Douglas Janoff, First Secretary to the, and to the Permanent Mission of Canada to the OAS, and Annick Lucier-Rez, Senior Policy Analyst with the Human Rights and Governance Policy Division at the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development. Canada wishes to highlight for the Commission the many ways in which Canada protects the human rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, two-spirited, and intersex Canadians. Canada is a leader both within the hemisphere and globally on this issue. At the same time, Canada recognizes that just as human rights law itself is ever evolving, so too is our society. Unfortunately, homophobia and related discrimination do still exist in Canada, and we must remain vigilant in raising public awareness, understanding, and respect for sexual diversity. Particularly concerning is the violent nature of hate crimes perpetrated against LGBTI persons and the difficulties faced by LGBTI youth. In my remarks today, I will first discuss the general framework for the protection of the human rights of LGBTI Canadians. I will then address some of the specific concerns that EGAL Canada raised in its request for a hearing before this commission. Canada is a federal state, and jurisdiction for the protection of human rights is shared by the federal government and the provincial and territorial governments. The rights of LGBTI Canadians are protected by a number of complementary and collaborative laws policies and programs at both the federal and provincial or territorial levels. While governments work to find innovative and practical solutions to challenges and to adopt policies and programs tailored to local needs and circumstances, they also share ideas, best practices, and lessons learned in order to achieve the common objective of equal protection of rights. Canada has a long history of human rights legislation starting with the adoption of the Canadian Bill of Rights in 1960. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which forms part of the Canadian Constitution, legally entrenches equality rights for all Canadians on the basis of grounds of discrimination such as sex, 
age, and religion. In 1995, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that the ground of sexual orientation is included in this open-ended list. All jurisdictions in Canada have adopted human rights legislation prohibiting discrimination on various grounds in regard to employment matters, the provision of goods and services to the public, and accommodation. This legislation supplements the constitutional right to equality in that it provides protection from discrimination by individuals in the private sector as well as by governments. These human rights codes expressly prohibit discrimination on the ground of sexual orientation. Human rights commissions and tribunals in various jurisdictions have also found that transsexualism and transgenderism are, covered, are protected as they are covered under the ground of sex. In addition, certain provinces and territories, namely Ontario, Manitoba, the Northwest Territories, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland and Labrador, have chosen to explicitly prohibit discrimination based on gender identity and or gender expression in their human rights codes. All LGBTI Canadians have the right to marry and to form a family. LGBTI couples have access to the same benefits as heterosexual couples. The Criminal Code of Canada prohibits inciting hatred in a public place and willfully promoting hatred against a person on the basis of sexual orientation. It is also an offence to aid, abet, counsel, or conspire with others to commit these offences. Sentencing provisions in the Criminal Code of Canada allow for increased penalties for offences motivated by hate against an open-ended li open list of identifiable, identifiable groups which includes sexual orientation and which can be interpreted to include gender identity. In addition to the existing legal protections, governments in Canada have put in place various programs and policies to protect the rights of LGBTI Canadians and to tackle homophobia and discrimination. For example, in May 2011, the government of Quebec launched a five-year action plan to combat homophobia. The plan is comprised of 60 concrete measures to support LGBTI people with respect to social, community, and employment matters, and to increase knowledge of sexual diversity. Amongst other key proposals, the action plan includes an educational campaign in the media to combat homophobia, the establishment of an office to combat homophobia, and a substantial increase in funding to organizations that advocate for and defend the rights of sexual minorities. The plan further provides for specialized training on LGBTI issues for police officers, prison guards, and health and social service workers. Other provinces have adopted strong anti-bullying laws and policies that protect LGBTI youth, particularly in the school setting, but also outside of school, and including on the internet. Such policies typically outline strategies for recognizing bullying, protecting children from being bullied, and developing bullying prevention initiatives. Tools have been developed to make students and teachers aware of homophobic and transphobic bullying, to inform LGBTI youth of how to reach out for help if they are being bullied, and to assist school administrators in protecting vulnerable students and supporting Gay Straight Alliances, or GSAs. GSAs are school-based groups that, wel that promote welcoming, respectful, safe and inclusive environments for sexual and gender minority students and others. They are run by students and supported by school staff, and GSAs are becoming increasingly present in junior and senior high schools across Canada. I would now like to turn the Commission's attention to three broad issues that EGAL Canada raised in its request for this hearing. The rights of transgender and transsexual Canadians hate crimes and bullying against LGBTI Canadians, and family policies that affect LGBTI Canadians. Beginning with protecting the rights of transgender and transsexual Canadians, as I've already noted, federal, provincial, and territorial human rights legislation protects against discrimination based on sex, which has been found to protect transgenderism and transsexualism. Certain jurisdictions in Canada have chosen to take a different approach um, and to explicitly list gender identity and or gender expression as a prohibited ground of discrimination in their legislation. At the federal level, um, 
as the petitioner has uh, explained, a private member's bill proposes to add gender identity as a prohibited ground of discrimination in the Canadian Human Rights Act. The bill has been passed by the House of Commons and is currently being considered by the Senate. The government believes that transgender and transsexual Canadians are deserving of equal respect, consideration and protection from discrimination. However, the government does not support the passage of this bill because it believes that the necessary protections already exist under the legal framework that I have just described. In the House of Commons, members of Parliament were free to vote for this bill in accordance with their personal convictions and were not bound by the government position. With regard to EGAD's concerns re related to transgender Canadians having to go undergo sex reassignment surgery prior to changing the sex designation on their identity documents, following a 2012 decision of the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario, Ontario became the first jurisdiction in Canada to allow transgender persons to change their gender on their birth certificates without first undergoing surgery. Other jurisdictions in Canada are moving in the same direction. In December 2013, the government of Quebec adopted a law, a law to allow transgender persons to change the gender on their birth certificates without first undergoing medical treatment or surgery. And more recently, on March 10th, 2014, the government of British Columbia introduced similar legislation. In, <coughs> excuse me, in some jurisdictions that have maintained the requirement that one undergo sex reassignment surgery in order to change the gender on a birth certificate, a transgender person can still obtain other identification documents, such as a driver's license, um, without having to undergo surgery. While access to medical treatment for transgender and transsexual Canadians tends to be greater in the larger cities, which we recognize, efforts are being made to extend appropriate health care services to trans Canadians outside of these few large centres, and there is growing capacity in this respect. For example, a trans health program that opened in Winnipeg, Manitoba in 2010 provides primary health care services to transgender individuals, including assessment and diagnosis, initial primary care services, coordination of care, and hormone replacement therapy. The staff also provides education and training, as well as mentoring support to general practitioners, um, physicians, and other healthcare providers working with transgender individuals. In 2011, Manitoba created a specialized program to provide support and services for children, youth, and their families who are dealing with gender identity. This program now works in collaboration with the Trans Health Program to ensure consistency and continuity of care. I will now turn to the issue of hate crimes and bullying against LGBTI Canadians. Canada recognizes that violence and bullying against LGBTI Canadians continues to be prevalent. Canada is also aware that hate crimes motivated by sexual orientation are more likely to be violent than hate crimes perpetrated against other groups. Canada in particular recognizes that violence and discrimination against two-spirited and LGBTI Aboriginal Canadians is a serious problem and that many two-spirited Canadians have felt the need to leave their communities. Governments in Canada are taking this violence and bullying very seriously. Most recently, in November 2013, the Government of Canada introduced legislation to address criminal behaviour associated with cyberbullying. Governments have been working to collect statistical information to better understand the scope of hate crimes against LGBTI Canadians and to assist policymakers to develop prevention and awareness initiatives. The Government of Canada collects, on a yearly basis, information from police services on hate crimes reported to and substantiated by police, where there is evidence that a criminal offence was motivated by hate based on the victim's race, national or ethnic origin, language, colour, religion, sex, age, mental or physical disability, sexual orientation, or any other similar factor. Unfortunately, Information reported to the police does not capture the true extent of hate crime since many incidents go unreported. Every five years, Canada's General Social Survey on Victimization therefore surveys incidents that have not been reported to the police and need not have been confirmed or substantiated. Recognizing that many incidents of homophobic and transphobic violence and other acts go unreported, 
The government of Quebec has provided support to the non-profit organization Gay Écoute to establish a registry of homophobic acts. Quebecers can report homophobic and transphobic acts in full confidentiality and receive information and assistance with available recourses. Several Canadian police services have established specialized hate crime units for the reporting and investigation of hate crimes. In addition, police services are offering specialized training for police officers to better respond to crimes against LGBTI Canadians. As an example of best practice, the province of British Columbia has created a hate crime team that includes members of the National Police Force, the Provincial Police Force, and the Vancouver City Police to coordinate investigations related to hate or bias in the province and to share experiences and information. In 2012, the government of Saskatchewan contacted EGAL Canada to co conduct its Report Homophobic Violence Period Program. Police training sessions provided 600 officers with the tools needed to identify and understand hate crimes based on sexual orientation and gender identity, and to engage with lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, questioning, and two-spirited communities. Governments are also developing special initiatives to prevent violence and hate crimes. For example, Newfoundland and Labrador's Violence Prevention Initiative is a government community partnership aimed at finding long-term solutions to violence against those at most at risk, including LGBTI persons. The initiative has developed tools to increase knowledge and understanding of homophobic violence. Bullying is an issue of public concern that affects a number of Canadian children and youth. Recognizing the extent of the problem and that certain populations, such as LGBTI youth in particular, are at greater risk of being bullied, the provinces and territories have been developing innovative strategies and action plans to address bullying. I have already discussed some of these strategies earlier in my comments. The Government of Canada is also supporting a number of initiatives that aim to prevent bullying and create safe spaces for youth in schools. For instance, the Public Health Agency of Canada published a series of documents that provide answers to commonly asked questions on sexual orientation and gender identity in order to assist professionals in addressing the impacts of homophobia and transphobia. In 2011, these documents were disseminated in over 13,000 schools across Canada through partnership with the Canadian Teachers Federation. I will now turn to the third and final question regarding the right of LGBTI Canadians to form a family. Across Canada, LGBTI couples have equal access to assisted human reproduction technologies as heterosexual couples. Same-sex couples are also treated equally to opposite-sex couples with regard to adoption. Birth registration, parenting orders, and adoption fall under the jurisdiction of the provinces and territories, and the rules do vary across Canada. For example, while most provinces only recognize two parents of a child, in Ontario and British Columbia, it is possible to have three legal parents recognized on a child's birth certificate, while in Saskatchewan, the Vital Statistics Act allows for a child to have up to four parents recognized from birth. In 2010, the Uniform Law Conference of Canada, which is comprised of senior representatives of the federal and provincial governments, drafted model legislation to provide basic rules for determining the parentage of children when assisted reproduction and surrogacy arrangements are involved. To date, two provinces have adopted legislation based on this model. In the provinces that have adopted this model, as well as in many other provinces, where assisted human reproduction is used, the birth mother and the spouse or common law partner of the birth mother are presumed to be the child's parents. Adoption is generally not required in the case where sperm is donated, regardless of whether the birth, partner is a man, birth mother's partner is a man or a woman. Lesbian co-mothers may be recognized as parents without having to engage the courts in eight provinces, at least in some circumstances. In situations of surrogacy, where the birth mother is not the intended mother, parentage orders, whether by declaration or adoption, are generally required for the two intended parents, regardless of whether the intended parents are a same-sex couple or a heterosexual couple. Recognizing the birth mother as the legal parent at the time of birth provides stability for the child, the ability to order necessary medical treatments for the child if required, and also re respects the right of the woman who carries the child, regardless of whether or not she intended to be a surrogate. Canada notes that in same-sex family disputes, 
courts have tended to award joint custody and generous time to the non-biological parent, finding generally that maintaining strong relationships with both same-sex parents is in the best interest of the child. Before closing, I would like to say a few words with respect to the role that Canada has taken in um, advancing LGBTI rights internationally. The promotion and protection of human rights is an integral part of Canada's foreign policy. Canada is deeply concerned by the proliferation of laws criminalizing homosexuality and violence committed against persons on the basis of their sexual orientation. We have spoken out on these issues on a number of occasions and will continue to do so. Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs has raised Canada's concerns directly with his counterparts um, on a number of occasions when laws have passed criminalizing homosexuality. And in addition, our missions on the ground are active in engaging with governments, regional and multilateral organizations, civil society, as well as affected individuals themselves to address these serious human rights violations. In closing, Canada is pleased to have taken part in this hearing today and to have heard the concerns expressed by EGAL. Canada strongly supports the rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, two-spirited, and intersex Canadians to live full and open lives, free from discrimination and ill-treatment, and with the same opportunities and aspirations as all Canadians. At the same time, Canada recognizes the need to continue working towards creating in Canada a more inclusive society, including by tackling the root causes of homophobia and transphobia. Thank you. I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much um, to the Canadian delegation. Exceptionally, Michael, I, I want you, so that we don't risk excluding anyone, um, to just explain the acronym LGBTQ2S. <laughs> and then I'll go to my colleagues. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so it's uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, questioning or queer, uh, and then to spirit. Thank you. Um, can I first um, ask my colleague and the country rapporteur, Rosemary Antoine, for her observations? Uh, thank you to you both. It's very clear that Canada has done quite a lot in this area and continues to do so and must be lauded for that. But I must say I was quite startled by the information that was presented by the petitioners in relation especially to hate crimes and homelessness and so on. And I, I don't want to speak for too long because we have a new rapporteurship on this issue and I want them to make, speak more. Um, but it, it reinforces for me um, what an important mandate the Commission has in promotional human rights activities. So I want to just encourage you to work with our new rapporteurship, work closely with them in terms of bringing about further change or improvements, and even the state has acknowledged that that is so. Um, I would, of course, wish to associate myself um, with the endorsing the calls you have made uh, for interventions on the issues of default line, including legislative change where necessary. I was going to ask about data collection, but then I think the state answered most of my concerns about adequate data collection, but I found the issue of homelessness for youth apart from hate crimes, which is in itself horrific, very troubling. Um, and I was thinking particularly of the right to education of young persons and that it has an indirect impact on that. I wondered if your data collection extended as far as to the schools, whether when there's a high level of dropouts, whether there was any attempt to get to the causes, which might have uh, might be helpful in this respect, since there seems to be a clear link. And um, of course, the state has a special responsibility towards children, um, an obligation to provide education, but just generally special responsibilities towards young people and children. And we do know that although it might be an indirect violation of human rights there in terms of rights to education and rights in relation to juveniles is no less a violation if it's indirect. So that was one thing that I thought might be a little area for um, um, improvement. I also wanted to find out, given 
given that the state seems to be aware of some of these statistics and these issues, is there a concerted effort to prosecute, especially when, as in the case of homelessness, um, the shelters, I'm sure some of these shelters are publicly funded, so it would be um, a public service, so there would be violations there and responsibilities on the part of the state there, whether there were, you could, whether we've had any effort to prosecute not just hate crimes, but failures to shelter persons or homeless, as you described, as a policy, as a concerted policy, as opposed to just having more interrogation investigation. But that, I think, might be helpful to change minds. And finally, I just wanted to ask about the impact on indigenous peoples. Um, we probably didn't have the opportunity to say much, but we did have a hearing last year, uh, which was very intriguing um, um, in terms of additional information, if we could elaborate on these issues as they impact indigenous peoples. I'm also the property of indigenous peoples, incidentally. Um, and or, because they're already, of course, vulnerable, um, already economically disadvantaged, and this would just be just another tier of discrimination. So those were my brief comments. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Cavallaro. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam President, and uh, <clears throat> my thanks to Egal. Uh, for the presentation, the information, and for helping to raise awareness here at, at, at the commission, my sincere thanks uh, to the distinguished representatives of the of the state of Canada for your presence, your um, and your work uh, within Canada and beyond on on these issues. Uh, and the commission certainly takes note of the comprehensiveness of uh, the Canadian commitment uh, to human rights and to uh, the human rights of. Uh, LGBTQ2S, I don't want to get the, the term incorrect as it refers uh, to Canada. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of brief questions. I understand the position of the state of Canada with regard to uh, Bill C-279, that uh, the changes that it uh, would seek are not necessary in that the rights are already protected uh, based on the interpretations of the Canadian Charter of Rights as you understand them. And obviously there's a difference, uh, and I, I, I was hoping that uh, maybe uh, both parties could speak to what the uh, legal dispute is there, what C-279 would do and why it's essential. Uh, and then uh, one of the recommendations, as I understood from the uh, pe par petitioning party, is uh, that I'm not sure if it's that there should be a national uh, strategy on homelessness and housing. Uh, but certainly if there is one, it, it should uh, include uh, LGBTQ2S uh, issues since there's such a disproportionate level among homeless, homelessness and particularly homeless youth uh, of, of uh, these communities. So I guess the question is, is there a single national homelessness policy or is this something that the provinces uh, would address? And uh, if there is an, uh, a, a policy on homelessness, uh, would it be possible to include particular concern to these issues given the disproportionate impact or disproportionate level of uh, LGBTQ2S uh, uh, youth in, in the homeless communities? Thank you. I invited Fanny Gomez from the Rapporteurship on the Rights of LGBTI Persons to join us. Fanny, any questions? Thank you, President. Um, just briefly, I, um, I as, as the commissioners and the president and vice chair, uh, was struck by the information provided by the petitioners and also um, quite impressed that, as to all the developments by the government. My, my only question was in terms of access to assisted reproductive technologies that the petitioner pointed out and I didn't necessarily see, um, I, we saw all of the developments in terms of uh, registering of, of third parents and even f four, four parents uh, for, uh, in, the, in the certificate, but we did, I didn't at least quite um, get the whole um, issue of discrimination vis-a-vis, -vis, or alleged discrimination vis-a-vis -vis ART. Thank you. Thanks. I, I too wanted to recognize the, the important developments in Canada um, and to thank Igal for the comprehensive um, data which you provided, which, and I like Commissioner Antoine was startled um, by some of it, particularly uh, the, the levels of hate crimes against um, LGBTI persons and particularly young persons, who is doing it and who is suffering. 
Uh, I wondered whether there was any information on intersex persons and whether Canada had guidelines for um, relating to medical services um, in relation to intersex persons and surgeries performed, particularly on um, young people and children who aren't in a position to consent. So I'd be very interested in that information if it exists. And whether the federal government has the ability to influence um, curriculum in private institutions and schools, um, given the, the focus on, on youth um, and that criminalization is key, but obviously not going to be adequate to address the, um, the source and, um, of, of the homophobia and the place where it's often most evident. Um, what was the capacity of the, the, the government to influence um, a comprehensive response um, through the educational system? And this is a matter which my colleague Rosa Maria Ortiz, who's the rapporteur for the rights of children, has already raised. Uh, I also wondered about the bill, and I, I would I'd reiterate the question from James Cavallaro about the difference. Uh, you know, if I'm in a jurisdiction where sex is mentioned, yes, I, I would try um, to include other issues within it. But if I have a choice, like a bill, uh, I wondered what the reluctance of the federal government was to um, clearly including gender identity um, as a category. Um, I think as a matter of interpretation, we do the best with what we have, but when we are able to legislate, um, I am assuming that we um, wish to give the fullest recognition um, to all those who we know suffer discrimination. I also wondered whether the question of recognition under the Charter um, was still an open question. Um, I imagine that there is a possibility as a matter of interpretation um, that I wondered um, as to whether the, the, there is a possibility that uh, questions of gender identity will also be considered to be prohibited grounds of discrimination. And then on the question of data um, and disaggregated data, you, um, the, the representatives of, this, of the state knew that um, the Rapporteurship for the Rights of Women and the Rapporteurship for Protection of Indigenous Peoples visited Canada um, last year. And um, we were very interested in data collected relating to, to Aboriginal persons. And we found um, challenges in finding that data. And so we're very interested in not just data on hate crimes, um, but disaggregated data, which gives us a sense of the extent to which persons um, who are African descendants um, face these um, crimes, or persons who are Aboriginal face these crimes. And so I wondered whether the state could tell us whether um, there is collection of disaggregated data um, which would help us to better understand who is most affected and impact um, policy initiatives to respond to the violence being faced. Uh, for the moment, can I start um, with Egal in responding for a few minutes to our observation? Well, th thank you for your, uh, your, your uh, reflections and your questions. Um, a lot, of, uh, a lot of very important points have been raised, and so I will just address a few of them, and then perhaps in writing we can provide you with a longer response. I wanted to start with uh, B Bill C-279, um, and we think there is no inherent reason why it should not be passed. As you said yourself, we think that it's a very important signal um, that gender identity rights uh, be upheld within Canada. Um, in Ontario, for example, we note that the province that there have been has been movement within the provinces to pass similar legislation. When the gender identity bill did pass in Ontario, it led to a renewed push by the provincial government to to retrain teachers on these issues, for example. And so, there's a large degree of symbolic importance, of course, with these types of legislation. And it's quite telling if the government opposes it. Um, and so we just don't, we do not think for gender identity that there's a compelling legal argument why it should not be passed. Um, we think that there's other reasons that might be behind that in that it's not popular with the government's political base, for example. Um, regarding data collection, this is a, this is a really important uh, issue as well. 
Um, and it's something that we struggle ourselves with, that it's not often, for Canada's Aboriginal communities, for example, we, we are often lacking data from more remote parts of the country on the, the types of homophobia that are experienced, the, the aggregate level of it. Um, and it, it is, it's really a matter of resources that prevent us from sort of being more knowledgeable about the situation across the country. And that gets back to the point that I raised earlier in the presentation, that there is a real uh, lack of funding for LGBTQ2S causes within the country, domestically. And although some provincial governments have been more willing to fund certain projects, and we work very closely with several provincial governments, we think that it's an issue of national importance as well. Um, and that greater collaboration between the federal government and community organizations that work on LGBTQ2S causes w would greatly assist that. Thank you very much. Um, forgive me and indulge me. One last observation about civil society. I think it would have been maybe your second to last or last comments. Um, the experience of the commission is, of course, that the state has an affirmative duty to ensure there's space for defenders to do their work. And that's not the issue here. Um, the, the commission has equally said, and I think particularly in relation to women's rights issues, that the state has a duty to work with civil society um, in um, seeking to resolve the problem. And the kind of structural systemic um, issues of violence and homophobia and transphobia will depend significantly on the initiatives which civil society undertake um, with the state and which invariably will, I think, require state support um, for the work of civil society. And so I would also, in my recommendations to the state, um, recommend an even stronger engagement with civil society and support um, for the initiatives of civil society to the extent that they are going to be absolutely essential in meeting the state's um, obligation uh, to protect LGBTI persons. Ambassador and your team. Okay, thank you very much to all of you for your, uh, your questions. Um, in the limited amount of time available to me, I'll try to respond to a few of them. Um, on the question of um, Bill C-279, um, recognizing gender identity, um, I really just want to reiterate that the Canadian government does strongly believe that transgender and transsexual Canadians are deserving of equal respect consideration and protection from discrimination. But adding the ground um, of gender identity to the Canadian Human Rights Act would not create new rights um, because gender identity is currently read into the existing legislation. Um, we do recognize, while the Government of Canada recognizes that what we say expressly in our laws can be meaningful in and of itself in a symbolic manner, the government is cautious to assume uh, the benefits of symbolic action without squarely evaluating the merits of a proposal. The government is concerned with the approach taken to define gender identity in the bill currently before Parliament. The general approach with regards to the Canadian Human Rights Act has been not to define grounds of discrimination, but rather to allow the grounds to evolve through the development of, a, of common law. Um, there was a question about equal access um, to assisted human reproduction technologies. And, and yes, um, in Canada, there is equal access to re assisted reproductive technologies um, for uh, heterosexual couples and same-sex couples. Uh, to deny equal access to assisted human reproduction technologies would go contrary to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and to the um, various human rights codes um, in the different provinces. So that is a protection that exists. Um, I'll also briefly answer the question on um, intersex persons, the rights of intersex persons, because that isn't something that we had the chance to address in our presentation. Um, and while there's no Canadian case law on point, it seems likely that a court would find that intersex persons are protected from discrimination on the basis of um, sex and or disability under both the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and under federal and, and provincial uh, human rights codes. Um, the term intersex, as you know, covers um, many congenital conditions in which the development of chromosomal, gonadal, and anatomical sex is atypical, and medical treatments for many of these conditions are available in Canada and are funded by the public health care system. 
Um, Canada recognizes that the medical treatment of intersex children raises uh, difficult medical ethics and human rights questions. And medical practices with respect to intersex children in Canada are evolving with the best interests of the child always center in decision making. Um, we also appreciate the work that the Commission um, is doing in this respect, um, and we support ongoing study and consideration um, of the issue in question. Um, in response to the one, one question about whether it's still possible for gender identity to be recognized um, as a ground of discrimination um, under the Canadian Char Charter of Rights and Freedom, it remains op an open question, um, which the development of common law um, may very well see such a recognition. I understand that there is a case um, in a province right now where um, that very question is being posed at a lower court level. So thank you very much. Thank you, Igal, and to the State of Canada um, for your participation in this hearing. Um, we at the Rapporteurship will follow up. We look forward to receiving additional information from you if you haven't had an opportunity to fully respond. Thanks to everyone.